This webinar was part of the International Association for the Study of the Commons World Commons Week. Are you interested in engaging with other common scholars and practitioners around the world? Become an IASC member. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, this is Juan Camilo Cárdenas. I am a faculty at the School of Economics at the University of Los Andes in Bogota, Colombia. Um, and it's a pleasure to, to be joining this webinar. Um, and I want to thank uh, Charlie Schweig for organizing this. I think this is a, um, an amazing enterprise to, to do this. And, and I'm very glad that we're going to be able to share um, these stories on the web and that these webinars are going to be recorded. Um, I am going to go ahead and uh, share my screen uh, with my presentation. And we start from there, um, and I will be more than glad to to take some questions at the end. Um, let me let me just say that um, this idea of doing some reflections on 20 years of of running experiments in the field um, had to do um, with the curiosity that emerged from um, seeing how different tools are being used uh, from different disciplines in understanding the problem of the commons. And, and this is an interesting year, of course, this is uh, about the, the 50th anniversary of the, of the article in Science by Garrett Hart in the Tragedy of the Commons. Uh, but I want to mention a couple more anniversaries that I think are relevant to, 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 my, to my talk. Um, one of them is Lynn Ostrom's uh, 1998 a presidential address to the uh, American Political Science Association. And in 1998, she uh, presented this presidential address that, that I think was the, 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 the preamble of what was going to be the decision of the Nobel Committee to award her with the, with the prize in economics uh, in honor of, of Alfred Nobel. Um, and being her the only woman in, in receiving this prize um, and who knows for how many more years this is going to be the only case. Uh, it's important because I think in this, in this presentation that she did and that turned out to be this article published in the APSR, I think it's a landmark piece that we should take into account to what I'm going, uh, about to say. Of course, going in the Commons, uh, published in 1990, is a very important piece of work and is her most well-known work. But this particular article on a behavioral approach to the rational choice theory uh, of collective action. I think it's an it's a, it's a, a excellent piece of information and there's this, this uh, uh, article that can give us a lot of the frameworks that in fact I'm going to be mentioning in, in, in a second. There's another anniversary that is important to my, to my work and it's the following. 25 years ago uh, in uh, Colombia, uh, my home country, uh, the government and, the, and Congress passed a, a law that is called Law 70 in 1993, and that is a, one of the most uh, revolutionary land reforms that we have seen in modern time. Let me put it this way. Because of this law, between 1996, more or less, and 2012, about 6, 6 million hectares of land were titled to Afro-Colombian communities. And when I say to communities, it's exactly that. There, there were collective titles of land that were issued to give communities, mostly Afro-descendant uh, Afro communities in the Pacific Coast, the right to access and manage land. And because of this uh, law, um, an important fraction of the Pacific Coast of, the, of this country and and, and in general, the most valuable territory in terms of biodiversity was titled through communal property, communal management and property of the, of the land. So during those years in the early 90s, I was starting my, uh, working on my, on my research uh, that preceded my dissertation work. And I was going to share with you this image of the very first page of my dissertation. And this is my dissertation that was uh, uh, finished in 1999. And this uh, first page reads on how the government had issued one of these collective titles through this law. 
and we're talking about about 700,000 hectares, uh, 1.8 uh, million acres of land to one particular community that gather about 45,000 people in this region in the Pacific Coast. And this it was a great introduction to my dissertation because I was interested in studying these issues of com communal property and com community management of resources. And at the time in the early 90s, there were a number of studies using um, theoretical models. There were a number of studies doing ethnographic work, including governing of, of the commons. But then came an important study that Jimmy Walker, Roy Garner, and Lynn Ostrom published in 1994 that I think is one of the most important pieces of work for introducing the problem of the commons um, to an audience that was interested in using experimental tools. Um, and this book became the, the, the start of an of a increasingly growing uh, wealth of literature in how to manage uh, to go to the lab, design experiments on the tragedy of the commons on the common pool resources and become an area of interest that to me was absolutely fascinating. Because I was at the time reading about this new law in Colombia. Uh, I was doing my dissertation on these issues and then I began to be introduced by, by this book, uh, through this book uh, of the use of experimental tools and that was to me fascinating how we could test Harding in the lab with actual human beings and see if that could be a way of trying to get into the questions of when and how uh, communities are capable of to avoid the tragedy of the commons and overcome this challenge and be able to be socially efficient through cooperation and collective action. Uh, now, one more piece of information here as an introduction is that this is very relevant today. We're talking about the 21st century. We could say that about a third of the forests in the world are through some kind of joint access management and property with communities, depending on particularities. If we look at the American continent that you can see in the map and in this table, we are talking about important fraction of countries that are in community ownership or management lands. Uh, Colombia is right there. You can see it there in, in the South American part with about 34, almost 34% of the land. But you can see many other countries where we are talking about important fractions of the, of the countries that are owned or managed by communities. And this is how relevant this is today to understand how these communities through different arrangements are capable or not to manage these this common pool resources and preserve not only biological diversity, but also cultural diversity, because in these cases, and through a lot of these uh, situations in, in, in Latin America and North America and Central America, we're talking about vast lands where indigenous communities of different kinds from native populations, Afro-descendants, have been entitled to manage in a collective way their, their lands. So this, as a, as, a, as a demonstration of the relevance of the problem, comes to mind in how these behavioral approaches that I was mentioning before, these experimental tools that are going to use by Garner and Walker and, and, and Ostrom, could be used to understand these particular problems. And to me, finish up, finishing up my, my dissertation and having defended, in fact, already, um, a, a particular event happened that I think is relevant to what we're saying. I was sitting next to Lynn Ostrom, who had just heard of my, of my dissertation work in Washington in the annual conference of the International Society for Institutional Economics. And Ronald Coase, another Nobel Prize uh, from Law and Economics, was delivering the main presidential address to this conference. And I was sitting in the first row next to Lynn Ostrom, having met her just recently and talking about my research on using these experiments in the field. And Ronald Coase read the following in his presentation. Economics over the years has become more and more abstract and divided from events in the real world. Economists by and large do not study the workings of the actual economy system. They theorize about it. As Ellie Devons, an English economist, once said in a meeting, if economists wish to study the horse, they wouldn't go and look horses. They would sit in their studies and say to themselves, what would I do if I were a horse? 
and they would soon discover that they would maximize their utilities. And this was a great piece because Coase was criticizing how economists didn't get it because they were not in the field looking at, looking at things, how actual human beings behave. And we were very happy to see this initiation of the study of the commons through experimental tools. But I was also puzzled that the studies that we're doing with actual human beings in the lab, in control situations, to see how they make decisions, instead of trying to theorize about it without knowing what humans do, was done with college students. And to me, that was puzzling because to me it was a mystery what would college students know about managing common pool resources. They might have some experience in their dorms or in their college life, but that's one thing and another thing is going and manage fisheries or forestry or water systems. And that to me was a puzzle that I would um, um, face at that moment in which I was starting my dissertation in the early 90s and I needed to figure out what tools what I, what was I going to, to, to use to study this problem of the commons. So I started this, this adventure of this dissertation and um, I was having that problem. Uh, what would weird people know about the commons? And by weird, I mean the following, Western, educated, industrialized, rich, democratic societies people. This is an acronym that was um, uh, launched by Joe Henrik and other co-authors in, in a paper published in 2010, in which they argued, as you can see in the pictures, that most of these studies that use experimental methods are based on college students that are a particular demographics. I'm not saying they are not real people. They are real people too but they're just a narrow demographic in terms of their age, in terms of the level of education, in terms of the context in, the, in which they live, in terms of their income levels, in terms of the political system they live in. And to me, that was very restrictive to think that I could test some of my questions and hypotheses that I was trying to test in my dissertation through the use of these experiments in the lab. So I decided that I wanted to go uh, to the field. So I began with my dissertation prospectus by writing out a payoffs function of what the commons problem is, look, is like. And, and this payoffs function that you see in the screen was inspired precisely on Ostrom, Garner, and Walker. So I took the main common pool resource game that was used there and I transformed it. And then I translated that into a simple payoffs function that I could take to the field and use this payoffs function to test this a hypothesis about the tragedy of the commons in which people needed to make decisions about their individual level of extraction of resources from the forest. And because of the level of extraction of others, we would realize in each case how much were the earnings of each particular player. And this table came from that payoff function that came from that particular uh, model that was presented by Austin Gardner Walker in 1994. And um, this included a, 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 an important and valuable co collaboration with my colleague and dear friend, Jeff Carpenter from Middlebury College, who at the time was also um, beginning to explore the possibility of using experiments in the, in the lab uh, to understand certain particular problems of humans uh, regarding reciprocity and regarding punishment and regarding uh, public goods contributions. And this collaboration with Jeff allowed me to to test these ideas and then how we could do the me trying to bring my experience from the field into the laboratory and see how could, could we design an experiment that could work in this way. And um, so we ran that very first experiment in July of 1998, uh, precisely 20 years ago or so. These are some images of that very first uh, experiment that we were able to run in the field. And uh, we just tested that. You can see in the picture the payoffs table and you can see the different players making their decisions and they were doing those decisions and depending on those decisions they would earn certain income levels during the game and that way we could test some of the hypotheses. Um, that wasn't a very promising start in the beginning because um, when we started the very first session and we allowed the players uh, to have a conversation among themselves which is one of the particular treatments that uh, Ostrom, Gardner, and Walker had in their book, in which face-to-face -face communication increases cooperation. Uh, I did just that. I wanted to replicate this in the, in the lab, in the field, and I allowed these particular players to get together. That's exactly that image that you see right there in the bottom uh, left of the screen. 
Mm. And these people, during playing the game, you can more together and they began the game. And what I got was the following reaction during one of the communication stages. And a particular guy uh, who was uh, participating in the experiment, which is a prominent leader from the community, um, came up with the following remark. And this is literal uh, in Spanish. I'm going to translate quickly. The guy said to the others in his group, I have been telling you that there is no logic here. This is called mathematics. And mathematics has no logic. This just comes in, adds, uh, subtracts, all that stuff. And in this game, there is no logic. One cannot tell which is the number that we should choose. I am not doing any agreement with anyone here. Let's just play whatever it comes. And that to me was frustrating. Uh, it was scary because this was the implementation of a laboratory experiment into the field. This was the very first session that I ran in the field. And here we go with a particular person who convinces, because he actually convinced the others, that he thought there was no logic in this game and they realized that there was no way in getting into an agreement with everybody else in the group and they just didn't come up with an accord or an agreement to reduce their extraction to improve the social efficiency. And in fact, in this particular session, cooperation did not go up. Later on, and this is the magic of experiments because you need to do a lot of replications, Later on, I realized that this was a particular case, uh, an outlier, because for the very majority of the rest of the sessions, cooperation increased and there were no problems with, with that regard. But this was a start that was interesting to, to see. Then I came to the, to the summer school for doctoral students uh, with Vernon Smith in 1998, and I um, presented this work to him because he was one of the, he is still today one of the grandfathers of experimental economics and one of the important creators of what we have today. And, and it was a fascinating exchange with him um, because um, he wasn't that excited at the time to see what the extra value or added value for bringing the lab to the field uh, would bring to experimental economics. Um, but I guess you just have to keep going. And so after that and after my dissertation work, and I decided to take these tools to uh, many other places in different areas of Colombia, both in the Caribbean coast that you can see in the north, in the Pacific coast, in the inner lands, in the Andes. And I began to replicate in different studies in different years during the late 90s and the early 2000s, and um, replications of these different games in different contexts to understand particular problems of watersheds, water management, fisheries, forestry, and et cetera with the idea of doing modifications of games and trying to understand what these games would uh, bring us in terms of learning. And also, as part of this uh, exercise, I would often uh, not only run the games, but stay in the community and run these workshops with the community to have a, an exchange with the people in the different communities about what just had happened in the games, to learn about their reactions, their impressions, their interpretation of the data, the reading of the games and what they could share about the games. And that was a very rich experience. And one of those experiences came in one of these workshops in 2000, in which one of the leaders who played in the game and decided to adopt a very uh, non-cooperative strategy of increasing his own extraction and rents really harmed the returns and the income of the others in his group. And after playing the game, he realized what had just happened. And he requested to take the microphone in front of those people in the picture in the bottom. And he addressed the rest of the group apologizing for what just had happened. He apologized because he realized that his own decisions harmed the others. And he thought that through the experiment, through different repetitions, he ended up realizing what the actual tragedy of the commons was. When you pursue your own interests, you cannot necessarily produce uh, uh, the general good. You can harm the general good. And this is what he realized from playing these experiments. And to me, that was a very telling experience in seeing how participating in the experiment is in itself a pedagogical experience for these people. 
So we continue to do this with colleagues all over the world in different places, replicating and replicating many of these experiences, not only within Colombia, but outside Colombia, in other countries, and continue to work on, on seeing replications of bringing these experiments to the, to the field and see what we could learn. And not only this allowed me to produce publications and get some research published in, in terms of results, but to me, there were some other open questions, and this is the, the, the last part of my, of my presentation, which is, can we use these experiments also to see how they relate to the actual daily behavior of people? And I'm going to show you just a couple of these uh, cases. One of them is in a particular project that we started doing with the, with the sponsorship of IFRI and colleagues in IFRI and other places, in which we went to a particular municipality uh, in the Andes, uh, three hours north of Bogota. And we there decided to implement one of the games that we have designed with my colleagues, Marco Jansen and Francois Busquet, Daniel Castillo and Kuchai were in, in Thailand, uh, who um, uh, in, in, this, in this project decided to um, design a project about irrigation, the problem of irrigation. So we designed this game with the idea of replicating certain special features of irrigation and particularly the problem between upstream and downstream users and the tensions between upstream and, and downstream uh, use of resources that flow uh, only in one direction. So we brought this game to this particular village and we decided to replicate this game in, in many cases with about 300 people in different places in, in this town and we did the following. Within that particular town, which is here near Bogota, we found three different communities uh, called Mariano Ospina, Ospina y Flores, and Santa Barbara. And in each of these communities, they have a particular local aqueduct. So we recruited 100 people in each of those aqueducts from upstream and downstream places. And with those people, we played this irrigation game. This irrigation game is in groups of five people. They play the game in different rounds. We try different treatments. And with those people, we decided that after playing the games, we wanted to repeat and go back to these places and play again the same games. So we decided to do our randomization in the following way. In one of the three aqueducts, in one of the three villages, we decided to have this as a control. So we did not have the actual experiments run in that particular place. We just had that as a control group. In the other two villages, two and three, we ran the games. We ran the experiments uh, in which these people play this irrigation game. And in the third village, not only we, did we play the experiments, but we also held these workshops in which we invited the players in the games and had a discussion about the results about the games and began to discuss with them what uh, uh, happened during the games at what was the ring and opinions about the results of the games. So we have one village with as a control with no games, the second village with only the games, and the third village with the games and the actual workshop. And the allocation of which village was going to get was was made through a raffle. The pictures there are of the raffles that we did the lottery to select with the local leaders which village was going to get which treatment. So we did that. We played this game in different rounds. In those rounds, we allowed them to rotate positions. We allowed them to have fixed position and have a group discussion along with the usual literature. And in the third village, remember, we had these workshops with the community members in which we showed them the results. And after the results, we had a conversation about their interpretation of the results. And we did that for a number of uh, months uh, between 2014 and 15. But we also had a great opportunity. It happened that the data from the water meters of these aqueducts was available. So you can see in the left, in the picture, one of the water meters that are in these in this, uh, farms, in these households. And we got a hold of the data set between 2012 and 2015 for every single household. And we could match the household to the people who played the games. And that's what we did. So we had data before the start of the games, which is this first dotted line, in which we had the pre-treatment data between January and February in 2012 of the consumption of water for all those households. Then we began our intervention in which we have, remember, a control group in which we have 
no games, and then the other two villages in which we got games, and in one of them, not only games and the workshops. Then we came back, this was in October 2013, we came back in January and May of 2014 and repeated the games in two of the three villages. We remained the third village as controlling, which we then ran the games. And we collected data again about the games. And then we stopped the intervention, which is this second dotted line. But we also had the water consumption afterwards for everybody from then on until October of 2015. So with those data, we were able to have the reading of the per capita consumption of water throughout all these bi-monthly readings of data for between 2012 and 2015. So we have all those data. And here in these shaded areas, you can see when we have the first stage of games and the second stage of games between the end of 2013 and the start of 2014. And remember, we had villages as a control, another one as only games, and another one as games and workshops. And with those data and the data in the games, we were able to follow up the actual water consumption of people. And what we found is that overall, the games had a positive impact in people's water consumption in the sense that the people who played the games in the first stage reduced their consumption. Then people who played the games in the second stage as a repeat of the games, they reduced further the per capita water consumption. And even those who participated in the workshops added an extra savings into the water consumption, uh, into the, into the, into the uh, readings of the water consumption throughout all these months. So this to us was a signal because we're doing all the controls and comparing against the control groups and also controlling against the same households before the start of the intervention with the games that it could look like these games have a positive impact in people's water savings behavior. And we did a falsification test by trying before the games if there were the, any pre-existing trends in water consumption and there were no pre-existing trends between the different villages. So do, we could do this falsification test from the data. Finally, another experience that, that is more recent is working with an indigenous community in the Amazon that was interested in designing and implementing its own environmental management plan. So what they called an NGO. And this NGO called us to say, we need a methodology to work within this community to see if we can design better tools for institutional design for managing the commons in this indigenous part in the Amazon. So if you locate yourself here in Colombia, in the tip of South America, this is about the Amazon basin, the Colombian part of the Amazon basin. And along these lines, there is a particular river, which is the Caquetá River. And this is the Caquetá River here from an aerial photography or a satellite image. And particularly here, there is this community. This is an image of that community. This is a collective title of an, of an indigenous community that owns about 200,000 hectares of collective property of forested land along the river lines. And this is where we brought here yet another of these games that we have done in this project with Marco Jansen and Francois Busquet and Daniel and Kopchai. And we put together another of the games. We translated that particular game to the, this particular indigenous community. And we implemented this game with the idea of testing what was the effect of the group dynamics when you have a common pool resource that changes over time. That it has the problem of a stock dynamic. That if you extract too much in one round, there will be less available resource in the less round, and therefore the tragedy of the commons exacerbates on time if you don't control the aggregate extraction over rounds because the rate of extraction and the rate of regrowth of the results are going to be in contrary directions. And that's what we did in this particular game. And we invited community leaders from this indigenous community, uh, younger generations and older generations to participate in this game. And we replicated these games there and we allowed them to have face-to-face -face communication. We also replicated some of the previous experiences with this game in other settings. And we allowed them also to have an actual discussion of their own territory, their own resguardo or collective title, collective property, and discuss where were the places or particular agents or particular situations in which they were facing the tragedy of the commons. And then 
thanks to the games and the discussion on the tragedy of the commons in this particular indigenous place, we were able to bring in Lynn Ostrom's design principles. And what we did was to translate these eight principles into their own language and logics of these indigenous communities. And finally, which was an amazing, interesting exercise that you can see in the, in the bottom right, is that we ask each of the participants which of the eight principles they thought were working best in their community and which of the eight principles were working the worst in the community. This was their own deliberation and reading of this. And here is the tally of the principles that they thought were working better. So principles one and three seem to be working quite well, <coughs> which is uh, limits well-defined and where majority of uh, users participate in the design of the rules. Whereas principles that don't seem to be working well there, definitely principle eight, they realized that the nested institutions problem was not there and they have a challenge there. And also principle five, regarding gradual sanctions. And this triggered a very interesting conversation with the games and with the reality that they were discussing in the territory on what they needed to do next to implement this management plan. And here the idea was that the games were a trigger of conversation in the communities for that purpose. And um, so in that sense, we could use different tools and different methods and using them together with the communities to create this dialogue, I think it's an important uh, tool here. And it is about tools at the end. And let me end with this beautiful quote by Vincent Ostrom, um, the, the dear partner and colleague that Lynn had throughout her life, in which she collected in the, in, in the work that was presented by the Nobel Committee, in which Vincent in 1980 said the following. And this is referring to how they created the workshop of political theory and policy analysis at Indiana University. The term workshop conveyed a sense closer to his philosophical view of science as a form of artisanship. The logic of our workshop has always been that there would be a variety of scholars across economics, political sciences, and other disciplines who work together trying to understand how institutional arrangements in a diverse set of ecological and social economical political settings affected behavior and outcomes. And I think that all these 20 years have been a lot about this and trying to look at this artisanship of finding particular tools, adapt, adapting them to the, to the field, then readapting re them again and again because of the context and see how these different tools come together in this artisanship of dialogue between scholars and communities and NGOs and public officers and try to read better these challenges about the interactions between ecological and social systems. And that's what I wanted to share today, this journey of 20 years working on the commons. And uh, uh, right now I would be more than willing to, to hear if there are any questions on, on this presentation. Awesome, thank you. Uh, yeah, so if anyone has, has any questions, uh, I'll just remind our attendees uh, to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you type within that, that Q&A function, um, then, then I'll be able to, to read the questions uh, to Juan Camilo. Um, it's, it seems as though we've, we've got one um, in our chat. So again, try to use the Q&A, but, uh, but we'll, we'll answer this one in the chat. Um, it says, okay. I've designed a simple system that makes these strategies live in real time. It works for disaster and beyond. Um, who's studying this and, and where can I work for these tools uh, in a better future? And um, okay, so I am trying to find here the chat. Um, and you said this is not in the Q&A, right? Uh, this one came from the chat. Right. And um, can, you, can you read again? Because I couldn't hear well uh, the, the question. Can you read again the question? Yep. I've designed a simple system that makes these strategies live in real time. It works for disaster and beyond. Who is studying this? Where can I work for these tools in a better future? Well, if, if I understand the question is, it's when does this can uh, lead to disaster in terms of, instead of, of, of improving? I, I haven't 
see much work uh, in, in terms of this, but, but if this relates to the problems of collapse, um, there is some work, some experimental work on collapse of, of ecological systems, but I am not very familiar with uh, works using experimental tools, um, although there are some experiments in which, um, and, and I have collaborated uh, more recently with this, um, uh, in, in trying to incorporate shocks to the system, and when introducing the shocks, uh, the shocks can lead to the collapse of the of the of the common pool. I don't know if that's the, what what the person is trying to ask on on this regard. Um, and there is some more recent work in which volatility of the resources or shocks to the system can uh, bring in extra challenges to the problem of the tragedy of the commons. But again, I, I'm not sure if this answers the question. Great, um, and, and feel free to ask a, a follow up. Um, again, in, in the Q&A, um, preferably. Uh, another question, um, where do you see your research going uh, over the next five years? Wow, that's, that's interesting. I, I mean, um, my, my work, because of this idea that participating in these experiments can be more of a pedagogical tool, uh, it's intriguing me a lot on whether applying experiments in the field, as I, as I mentioned in my presentation, can, be, can have a pedagogical experience to people in communities. And I see there something to explore further. If whether we can see these tools as learning um, devices for social dialogue within communities uh, and along these lines. Uh, my, my friends and colleagues, uh, Ruth Mainson Dick and Marco Jansen, and all the collaborators with PES in India, uh, just published a paper precisely on that too, in trying to use these games and see what can be learned about bringing these games as pedagogical tools in communities. This is something that I see myself pursuing. But I also see myself pursuing uh, is the problem within the profession of economics. If you remember that original quote from Ronald Coase, criticizing economists, and, and not surprisingly for many, you probably have heard of so many experimental studies in which people who study economics and finance and businesses on general seem to be less cooperative in the experiments in the field, in the lab, I'm sorry. And um, what does that say about the training of economics uh, in people, the, 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 the training and the teaching of economics as a discipline? Maybe it is self-selection, but maybe it is indoctrination. And to me, that's a great challenge. And in the, in the next coming five years, I see myself also trying to see if through the use of experiments in the classroom, going back to the classroom from the field and the lab, we can improve the teaching and the training of economists that the gains from cooperation are more viable sometimes than the gains from trade or the gains from competition. Great. Uh, and again, I, I can, I'll remind people that they can use the Q&A. We might have time for, for one or two more. Um, here we've got uh, another one. The strategy I've designed from takes its starting point as the individual and understands them in context with others in the community. Typical tools and systems do not empower the individual as the primary stakeholder and recipient of data. Yeah, I mean, this is more, more than, a, than, than a question, it's a, it's a comment, and, and, and I would be glad to, to react to this. Um, I, I, I agree in the sense that we have a problem when, when, when the tools and the systems are not empowering individuals as, as primary stakeholders. Um, the idea, and, and also this issue of being recipients or beneficiaries, beneficiaries of data from those exercises. And I think that there's a dimension to these tools in which if you combine them with participatory tools, you can bring data back to communities and empower them. That's one step. The second step is not only to empower individuals, but also to empower those individuals in community, in the group dynamics, so that they create an even stronger impact 
when they are aggregated. So it's not only about empowering individuals, but also empowering groups. And I think that's a, an even greater challenge because empowering groups through some of these tools and empowering groups through better data um, can have a very interesting dynamic in which groups, communities, become better, um, better um, uh, stakeholders in the dialogue with other domains of power like uh, the government or the private sector or the NGO sector. Perfect, thank you. And, and, and seeing as, as we have no other questions, it works perfectly, we're, we're at the 45 minute mark. So on behalf of, of the IASC and all the world's common week organizers, I, I'd like to thank all the attendees um, and Juan uh, for preparing and, and giving this, this very interesting uh, webinar. Uh, in closing, we'd like to remind people of two upcoming IASC events, both of which are advertised um, at the top of the World's Common, worldcommonsweek.org website. Uh, so in November, IASC is holding their first virtual conference. And in July of 2019, IASC is holding its biennial uh, in-person conference in Lima, Peru. Uh, the deadline for paper abstracts for that is uh, November 15th uh, of this year. So November 15th, if you want a paper ab abstract, for July 2019 for the in-person uh, conference in Peru. Again, on behalf of I IASC and, and the World's Common Week organizing team, uh, thank you all for attending and, and thank you again, Juan. Sure. Thank you. And thank you everyone for listening and thank you guys for organizing. Charlie and Kobe, you have done an amazing job in putting this all into work. Thank you very much. Okay, bye now.